Cool. Dinner's ready. Let's see what we've got. Oh, bearings again. <laughs> Welcome to Tweed's Garage, where in this episode I'm continuing with the uh, rebuild of my 1939 Excelsior Universal, fitted with its Villiers 9D engine. No, I can't do any Riley yet, because look at the state of my bench. It is absolutely stuffed full with Villiers innards. So I've got to put that together first, and then we'll get back on the Riley. Promise. Um, so what have we been doing this week? Well, we've been sort of doing the little, if you saw the last video, um, you'll know that I found a couple of faults that needed repairing before I put the uh, engine back together. So this video contains those. If you didn't see the last video, uh, shame on you, but you can go back and find it. And there is a playlist as well uh, on the Villiers and the Riley. If you've missed some Riley stuff, I'll put a link down for the uh, Riley compilation of uh, woes, errors, and uh, rebuild stuff. Um, yeah, so let's get down to what we've been doing this time. So the first repair I had to do was on the kickstart shaft. Try saying that when you're drunk. Um, it had a crack in it that was running through it, and also it was sort of badly worn where the pool sits, sits in, in position. So the kickstart shaft needed welding up. It had the crack running through it. So what I'd done was clamped it in the vise to close the crack up a bit because it had, had op opened up. Uh, and with that clamped down, I ran a Dremel with a small grinding disc through the crack just to go down into the base metal a bit to be able to fill it up with new weld. So with that ground out, it was a case of firing up the TIG welder and running a bead along the crack to uh, weld it back up together. So as well as the crack, I built up the edge of the pool housing that I got broken away. So I built that up with a bead of weld. And then because the weld had sort of pulled down into the hole where the kickstart pool goes, I put it on the mill and run a carbide cutter down into that hole to clean it up, to clean the weld up. So the repair has gone quite well. I'll drop the carbide end mill down there to clean out the, clean out the weld and then sort of finish it off with a file to fit around the pool because the pool finish isn't isn't accurate um, I think it's a sort of little forged item so that fits in there quite nicely and there's a nice action on that now and bites in um, so what I, will, what I will do is run another bead of weld down here just to try and build this uh, backing lip back up again it's about right there, it needs to come all the way along. And then what has come out when welding it, yeah, you can see it. The crack, although it wasn't visible before where I welded it, you can see the crack spreads right round, right round there. So what I'm going to do is grind it a little bit further out, maybe put a little hole in the end of the crack and then weld that back up and uh, finish it off and we should be done.
so just when you thought you were finished um, I've got to make a new clutch adjustment bolt I don't think this is original it's just a brass bolt jammed in there and then the other thing is this uh, clutch lever it's not supported on the outside edge I think you know this should be something like a, an adjuster with a shaft on the end of it to support the outside edge of the clutch shaft there it's only it's only supported in the middle so need to make something up to go in there so I'll check the uh, parts book and uh, we'll make something up appropriate so let's have a look it doesn't seem to show anything so unless somebody's modified it you know drilled through it and put that on I don't know but it doesn't doesn't show the it doesn't show how the how the lever is uh, attached to the gearbox housing either I'll give it a ponder no no my mistake number 31 just there clutch push, push rod adjuster there is something there but still nothing there so we'll make something up With the clutch arm removed it was obvious there's a lot of wear on it around the pivot hole where the pin went through so to remedy this i broke the mig welder out and proceeded to weld up the sort of inside inside of the holes to make a base and then i could turn the arm up the other way and from the top fill the hole from the bottom up Then it was a case of putting it in the vise and filing it to shape, ready for uh, putting it on the milling machine and uh, drilling a new hole. With the arm filed to shape I held it up against the gearbox casing and marked the position of the hole through the arm because the casting is sort of um, not very uniform. I had sort of guessed sort of roughly where the hole went through. And then mounted it in a very small toolmaker's vise which is quite handy. It allowed me to adjust it one angle and then clamped it in the milling vise and that, that gave me another angle of movement as well to try and get it lined up as best I could. So then it was a case of uh, centre drilling it and then running through a pilot drill and then a few more drills to bring it up to size and then the final size drill to bring it to the finished size.
So I needed to make a new pivot pin and I had some steel stock that was the right diameter. Um, I just needed to know the hardness of it. So I broke out my Leco hardness tester and it was a bit rough and ready because it's a round bar, but I balanced it in there and tested the stock that I had and then tested the old pivot pin and um, going by the whips of the diamond on both of them, they were, they were pretty close to each other. So I suspect they're about the same hardness. If anything, the new rod was slightly harder than, than the old. So I then proceeded to turn up a new rod. So with that done, I then needed to make a new clutch adjusting screw. And I used the same stock, pop that in the lathe, and with a radius cutter, turned a ball end on it. It's quite a good way of turning a ball end if you've got a few radius cutters. Just mount them in the lathe tool holders so that they're horizontal with the workpiece and uh, just use the one cutting edge and just sort of gently plunge cut it in and towards the piece. And as long as you take it slowly and plenty of lubrication, you can turn a nice, nice ball end quite easily. They're also handy for putting a radius edge on a turned piece that you're making as well. And then turned it down clearance size for the thread that was going on it. I then started to part it off to length and then when I was halfway through I withdrew the parting off tool and filed a slight chamfer on, on the uh, screw so that it would be easy to start cutting the thread when I flipped it over. And then with that done I continued to uh, part the piece off. part was then flipped over, faced off, then the thread was cut with a quarter inch BSF die. As you can see I was using my new large die holder that I made with the flat back to it and you can see it just pushes up nicely against the drill chuck and, uh, and then I can just wind it in, keep the pressure on and cut a nice straight thread. So all that was needed to finish the adjusting screw was a slot in the end for a screwdriver. So I popped it into the milling machine and uh, cut a slot with a slot, slotting saw. Slotting saw? Slitting saw. Slitting saw. And I also turned up two nuts from a piece of hex stock that I had as well because the, the one nut was missing and the other was a sort of modern one. So to finish the clutch adjusting screw 
I needed to harden the end of it so I've got some case hardening powder and uh, what I done was heated the end of the ball till it was sort of cherry red then dipped it in the uh, case hardening powder moved it around to give it a good coating on the end and then you take it out and then heat it up again you heat, heat all that powder up again till it gets to the metal gets to cherry red and sort of burns most of it off and then plunge it into cold water to complete the process and then all, all the debris and the powder drops off and it's just a case of running a wire brush over it to clean it up. Hold your breath, make a wish, count to three. Come with me and we'll see Mr. Tweed build his first crankshaft. Okay, so we've got it resting on there through the hole in the middle to uh, for the crankshaft go through, but also there's a bit of a raised area here we've got to avoid. So I want to rest on this flat bit here and flat bit at the back. And I've applied a bit of thick oil just to uh, help proceedings and avoid galling. I'm going to need a rag. Here we go, stage one. Oh, let's change that to this one. We'll see what we're doing a bit better there. a bit of an air gap around the bottom. Can you see there? There's a gap there. I suddenly realise what it is. I've got to put a spacer under here now just to let this push push through. It's resting flat on the bottom. There we go. Homeward bound. Then stack the rollers on top. The bearings on the old one, there was only six rollers. I'll show you in a little side video. There was only six rollers and six brass spacers. And they were full length rollers. Whereas on this, on the newer style, well newer, yeah, 10 years newer, so about 70 years, they changed the design to these half rollers or split rollers and no spacer in between. That's probably why the old one wore out and all the other bearings were okay, because it was only running on six bearings. It's quite quite good, this gear oil, for holding things in place. It's a vintage 140. That's quite sticky. And it gives me a bit of lubrication whilst I'm trying to get the thing started initially, because reading up on Villiers, two strokes there after rebuilds they're not too keen on starting and uh probably with it on choke kicking it over and fuel running for it will soon wash this oil away line them all up there we go Better than the original one. Okay, now the balancing job begins. Can you see fellas from the back? The next thing I've got to check is the flywheels. How am I going to get round there? Right, bear with. I did describe the flywheel before I took it apart, so hopefully we can get it fairly close. Oh. 
out there. And again, we just need to clear the crank pin to push it all the way home. Right, fingers crossed. There we go. Couple of tons on it just to make sure it's all home. There we go. No side to side slop and no up and down slop. So all we've got to do is put it in the lathe and clock these two shafts up. Apparently all you do is just belt it to get it into line, but we shall see how much belting you have to do. One crank rebuilt. So I'll set the clocks up and uh, it was way out, it was about 0.25 of a millimetre and it needs to be 0.03 of a millimetre run out between the two. Um, so not wanting to look an idiot, I did give it a bit of a clunk, take it off and give it a bit of a clunk, but it has, uh, it has brought the reading down a bit. So we're 0.7 that side. Sorry, 0.07 that side, 0.03 that side. So inspect one side. So we'll give it another bang with the camera. I'm just basically doing is holding, rather than damaging the clocks and risking it, you can see where the copper witness mark is there, just giving it, holding this side and just giving it a bang in my hand sort of thing. And that does seem to move it round. There you go, I'll just uh, carry on playing around with that, see if we can get it any better. Right, I'm back. I've been trying all sorts of things and chasing my tail. Um, popped the crank back in the press and gave it another squeeze because I think what had happened, it had started to close up like that a bit where I kept putting it between the centres. Um, that's improved matters. And I've now got it hardly any run out when it's in the same position all the way around, it does move 0.05, but it's on both sides. The zero, and then it goes one, two, three, four, five, four on this side. So there's one thou, uh, 0.01 difference, which is within tolerance as close as I can get it. And it's, I've measured it here on this outer journal and here as well. And it's, uh, it's the same sort of run out in the same position. So whether it is, there's a bit of ovality on, on the bearing journals where it's been in the grinder originally, I don't, I don't know. But as it matches, because originally before it was out, so one side was going negative and the other side was going positive to each other but now they're moving both at the same same rate in the same direction so that would that would suggest to me there's a bit of sort of ovality on both of these journals so i'm going to take that as as best as i can do it and i spent about three hours doing it so i think we're about there so now i've got the crankshaft pushed back together and clocked in uh, it's time to put the bearings back on so i've got a plain one to go on here and then I was going to use the two lipped seals one on this side and one on the outer edge on this side uh, pick out the inner inner lip so the oil can get to it 
leave the outer lip so it helps with the uh, crankcase sealing. I'm going to um, do that on this side because there isn't a problem with lubrication. If you look in the crankcase here, this is where the oil, there's a bit of a lip lip inside here. So the, the oil and petrol mix sort of rests on there and then the oil drains down, comes out through that hole there and then runs down between the two bearings, these two bearings here on this side. So lubrication is not a problem. So on this side, the oil collects on this ridge and runs down to the outside of the bearing. So I can't leave the lip seal in because the oil won't get to that bearing. Okay, so I'm gonna just rip both the lip seals out. I could have got a plain one for there, but it, it, it doesn't matter. The other thing I was, was sort of suggested to do was leave the bushes in, but this bush on the outside edge has been galling and picking up. Um, so it's been sort of rubbing on the crankshaft. So I'm gonna leave these out and then keep hold of them. So if anybody ever wants to put them back in, they can. And I'm gonna leave the bush out of the other side, but I am going to uh, use the spring because it does act as a bit of a, a bit of a shim. So I don't wanna put the um, spacings out on the crankshaft. So that pair for that side, and that one for there. Oh, that was easy. There we go, that's starting to cool down and grab already. So those bearings dropped on lovely, just a little bit of heat, about 120 degrees for sort of five, 10 minutes. And uh, on they popped rather than sort of straining, trying to get them on with a press. That's all ready to start reassembling the cases. So there you go, we've corrected all those faults that the uh, engines picked up over all those years. And uh, so it's just time to uh, put it back together, but time's getting on a bit. So uh, I'll see you in the next video, right? Cheerio. gone. Oh, oh, over there. Oh, boy. I've managed to lose the bloody gearbox cover. Oh, there it is.
So with that done, I needed to make a new pin. So I had some steel rod. Where the bloody hell is it? Progress is being made, fly. Faults from years gone by, still fly. <laughs>